G'day and welcome back. Welcome to the final video in this course which is entitled Classroom Resources for the Early Years. Of course we're talking about classroom resources for the teaching of mathematics. So I've got seven different resources that I want to talk about. Several of them I've mentioned already um, at varying levels of depth. Um, in terms of the discussion, but I thought it was useful just to go through a number and give you some ideas about how to use them and their strengths and weaknesses. So, um, and they're in an order, so I've listed them here on the board and you'll find them in the notes as well, from the simplest to the most complex. There is actually another one, I haven't included it here because, simply because you wouldn't use it in early years, and that's an abacus. So the abacus is more abstract, more complicated, more difficult to use, more versatile. All right, so let's move on. So we're going to start with counters. Um, and if you're following in the notes, you'll see that I recommend that the counters should be plain and simple. These are perfectly fine. There's nothing special about them. Um, it's nice having magnetic ones because I teach to the video a lot using this whiteboard and it's got a metal back. The magnetic um, resources of different sorts are just brilliant. So they just stick to the board. These are nice and colourful. You can no doubt get other colours. I'm happy with just the three that I've got. The main thing, as I've said in the notes, is to keep them simple. We don't want them to be complex. We don't want little pictures on them. We wouldn't want multiple parts to a picture. So, for example, if you had little butterflies on them, each butterfly has two wings. And so there's the potential for someone to get distracted. So we don't want the students distracted at all. The other thing to say is just as numbers are an abstract idea, as I've said in the first video, and it's, if it's a sort of pure idea that a number is just a number, it's nothing else, it's got no color, it's got no other attributes, it's just this, as I said earlier, sort of pure concept. We want the counters that we use to be similarly free of distractions and free of other characteristics. So my only concession, I suppose, to other characteristics is that they're different colours. But I would be very careful not to let students feel that the different colours meant something. I'm never going to use, you know, yellow ones to represent tens and blues for ones or anything like that. That would be um, completely inappropriate. So nice and plain counters. Of course, um, they're really suited for numbers up to nine. Um, so we're not going to use them very much for place value teaching um, because we want them to be bundled. So the bundling happens when we use a 10 frame and we can use multiple 10 frames. So they will work um, to teach place value, but we're not going to go very far with them. Of course, that leads us to the second resource, which is the 10 frame. And I've talked about that already. I have, as it says in the notes, there is another online PD course you may be interested in entitled 10 frames and what have I called it? 10 frames and numbers to 20. So you may be interested in that goes into a lot more detail about how to use 10 frames and what they are and so on. But basically, um, in terms of a resource for teaching mathematics and early years mathematics, the 10 frame, as I've said repeatedly, including in the notes, is the best resource that I've ever come across bar none. Um, it's not commercial. You can make your own. Um, I mean, you could probably buy commercial ones, but you don't need to. These I've laminated myself just using, a, you know, one of those cheap laminators. So they last a bit longer. Um, they're such a simple idea. They're just brilliant and really versatile. So again, I'm not going to go into great detail here. Suffice it to say that a 10 frames value comes because it has 10 squares and because 10 is the base of our enumeration system, as I've said in another video. So that's the point. We're not using eight frames. We're not using frames of multiple numbers. It's just 10 frames. By the way, that includes not using five frames. I've heard of five frames. I don't think they're helpful. I would abandon them. If you've got some, I'd put them in the cupboard. You know, let someone else use them if they want to. You can use them. Of course you can, and you can put two together to make 10. But I don't see the value in having students having multiple sizes of frames, even two different sizes. To me, it's a distraction and you don't need it. Five isn't that special. Ten is. Ten is fundamentally, you know, vitally important for understanding the numeration system. Okay, so ten frames. Dice. 
Now I remember when I was a, a young student teacher we were talked to, told about dice and in an early years um, context it was recommended that we help our students to recognize patterns and as I turn these around of course um, you can see patterns straight away. They're subitizable patterns, they're really common we use these for all sorts of games and pastimes and I'm not talking about gambling but just you know family friendly games that you can play and it's really helpful for students to become familiar with the patterns. The only limitation I can think of for dice is they only have six faces so, and that's because of the geometry of it you can't make a ten faced dice that's a cube. Now there are ten faced dice and they can be very useful and you can have them with numbers from 0 to 9 which is great for doing more place value work and, and you can play lots and lots of really great games. So those dice I'd also recommend, I don't have any here to show on the video. These are great up to a point, basically up to that number, up to 6. Um, and the students will become familiar with those patterns through using them. So everybody recognizes that's five without counting one, two, three, four, five because they've used dice so often and children will get that as well. It's just a shame they only go to six. Okay, so dice are useful, um, we're just not going to overemphasize them. Moving on then to egg cartons, this is a little bit of an unusual one. I've come across it a couple of times. The idea of putting different numbers into the spaces in an, in an egg carton now this one just has two rows of six spaces for the 12 eggs. It's not clearly divided in the middle. Some of the ones I've seen have a clear half dozen at each end. This one doesn't. Again, it's a bit like the dice. It's of some use. You could do some interesting games and activities and have children think about numbers and so on. But the problem is there are 12 of them. If you have an egg carton with 10 in, go for it because you know that makes a group of 10 and that helps us see the collective multi-unit idea and we can use it for place value. We can't use this for place value. You could use it for number facts, the sum number facts you could do with this. Certainly double six, the fact we've got six in each row. And assuming in your country eggs are sold in dozens, uh, making an assumption here, I know you can get them in different sizes, but assuming you have 12 in a pack, double six is quite easy. Double three is not too bad if you've got half a dozen. So two threes are six, you can see 10 plus two. So there's some number facts we can do with it, but it's not going to help our students learn about teen numbers or the numbers from 11 to 19 because it's got the wrong sized bundle. All right, so again, we can use it. It's got some uses but they are somewhat limited. I should check back at my notes to make sure I'm not missing anything else. All right, Unifix Cubes. Now that is a um, brand name, so it's a commercial resource. They're like this, so if you haven't seen them then I'll just show them to you so you can see them. They're readily available at educational stockists. I've seen them um, in the United States, we bought these in Australia, I'm pretty sure I've seen them in the UK. So they're pretty well found around the world. I believe the company that markets them is called Didax, D-I-D-A-X. They're quite nice, they're colourful, they're easy to handle, they're a nice size. You can get much smaller cubes that will join together. We've got some where I work and they're horrible. They're one centimetre cubes and you've got to really force them and then you can't get them apart and kids use their teeth to you know, detach them from each other. These are much nicer. They're really nice to handle, they feel nice in the hand. They're big enough to see what they are. Okay, so up to that point they're great. You can use them as individual counters. I do like the fact that they join together. Unlike the counters we looked at before, you can't connect those and then pick them all up together. The only thing you can do is put them in a 10 frame. These will actually join, so once you've joined them you can hold them up and say look here is a group of, and in this case it's 10. Now here is the weakness. You could say here is a group and this is a group of 9, and this is a group of 8, and this is a group of 7. In other words there isn't a clear easy way of making sure that you've got 10 in a group. This one here is a group of eight, but I don't know that without, now I've lined that up with the ten to see there are two missing so I know that's eight, but otherwise I would need to count those in some way, you can't subitize them easily, there's no straightforward way of seeing how many there are. That's the limitation. 
Now I have seen plastic frames you can put these into and the frames have an, a numeral at the top to tell you how many you've got. So you can get basically like little 10 frames for the Unifix cubes. That's a positive idea because then you could say here are some 10s and you know they're a 10 because you can see how these fit in the frame. You can also get frames for 8 and 7 and 6 and 5. I don't think they're helpful. We're not really interested in groups of 7 and 6 and 5 and 4 and other numbers. It's groups of 10 and then single ones. So again there are things you could do with them. It's just if you're going to spend that hard-earned money you know the schools had earned money on buying resources I don't think these extra numbered frames are particularly helpful so if you can get the frames with 10 that's fantastic you could draw a template in a print out templates on paper so that might work and you could put these on top of the template and everybody can see that's 10 you just need some way of measuring it and then with the extras I would separate them so don't be forever joining them together we actually want the students to see the ones as single ones. I've heard them called singletons, which is an interesting word, but um, basically you want them separated from each other. So these are the individual discrete one at a time counters. And this is the bundle. And this is the bundle that gets the numeral one because it's 110 and then it makes up a number like 17 and so on and so on. Okay, so Unifix, quite good. Then we move on to bundling sticks. Now that's the name we use for them in Australia. I have no idea what you call them in other countries. I know the sticks themselves in Australia, these are called paddle pop sticks, which is an unusual name. In Brit Britain, I know they're called pops. No, is that? No, I see pole sticks. No, I'm getting all mixed up now. I can't remember what they're called in England. I think they're called pop sticks in the United States. Whatever you call them, if you can get these, they're a great little resource. Now this is a bundle of 10. They're wrapped together with an elastic band. It does need to be elastic. I've had students try and get away with twist ties and hair net ties, and all, hair, hair, what are they called? Hair elastics, all sorts of things. Basically it needs to be a rubber band. They have to hold it firmly so when you pick it up they don't fall out. Now again there's a limitation here. We would have to count these sticks and make sure they're a 10. But students can do that, so that can be part of their practice in using the materials. Just be aware when you pick a bundle up and put some more with it, it's a good idea to check the number before you do anything else, because we'll want to unbundle these. That's one thing we'll do with, I've mentioned that earlier on. You need to unbundle the tens and show all the sticks and then bundle the ten back together. The students will need practice using the rubber bands. It's not that easy with small fingers and students are developing their fine motor skills so you've got to you know wrap it around your hand and wrap it and twist it and wrap it don't get rubber bands that are too big because it takes forever to wrap them up blah 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 all right so these are really great i have discovered that at least in this country <clears throat> if you buy these as um, craft sticks and that's another way they're sold they're quite expensive and you can get multicolored ones and you know people who do craft things um, will use these for decorating things that they're making you don't need the colors they're not that it, that's, that's not helpful it, it looks more attractive so if you like it go for it but again don't make any significance about the color but they are about 10 times the price we've collected these at home by just waiting until our children had um, icy poles, ice blocks, whatever you call them where you are, and then save the sticks, put them through the dishwasher, and you know, so they're, they're free, effectively, if you're already buying the ice, ice, ice blocks. Um, alternatively, I found these are cheap if you buy them as coffee stirrers. So if you go to an office supplies store, they will sell these for about one or two cents each, whereas a, as a craft stick, they're probably 10 cents each. And you can buy them by the thousand as coffee stirrers, so that's just a little tip. Now, these will work quite well. Now, the Unifix cubes, you can go up to 10s. You could probably manage 100 in separate sticks of 10, but you wouldn't go beyond that. So for place value, Unifix cubes will work um, up to 99 quite easily. Bundling sticks, you can go further because the bundle of 10 isn't that big and you can get a collection of 10 bundles bundle them together put another rubber band around it as it shows on the notes and so you can have a hundred bundle now the real beauty of this and this is um, by way of comparison with the next resource the last one which is based 10 blocks 
The beauty of this is you can pull them apart. So if you have that bundle of 100 as an exercise, you could have your students unbundle it and put out all the bundles of 10 and count them, the bundles, make sure there are 10 bundles of 10 and talk about the fact that 10 10s are 100 and then unbundle the 10s as well undo all the bundles, put all the sticks out, count them all, you know, bundle them all back together. It would take a long time, but I really think that sort of activity will conceptually help the children understand what this 100 really means and why it looks like that, why we record it that way. And, you know, this is for, in this country, probably year three students learning about place value, the hundreds place. I think it's grade two in the States, year two in the UK. Um, you'd have to look that up. I'm sure you know what it is already. Okay, so bundling sticks are fantastic. They will do place value all the way into the hundreds place. And you can always see the bundle. I mean, this here has individual sticks in it. You can see the individual sticks. You can pull them out and put them back in together. It captures that idea of the collected multi-unit brilliantly. It, this is probably my favorite resource. So after the 10 frame. 10 frames are the best. This is a close second and for older students probably beyond the early years but as we move forward this would be the next resource for doing place value activities um, without a doubt. Last one we're almost at the end of the video and end of the course we'll talk about base 10 blocks. Now these have different names depending on where you teach once again. I try to cover as many bases as I can but of course you'll, you may be in a country where I don't know what they call it so my apologies for that. Here are three different sizes. There is a fourth one I don't have with me today and that of course is the thousand block. So we have a hundred block, a ten block and a one block. Again this goes a bit beyond the early years especially with this one but you might feel like you may use base ten blocks with just the tens and the ones with early year students. So as, again as they're developing their place value understanding starting in the T numbers but especially from 20 onwards 20 to 99 these are a very good resource. The advantages of these are several. The sizes are all consistent as they are with all the others to be honest. Um, they're based on a one centimeter cube which is nice so if you're teaching students any sort of metric measurement you can use these for measuring well you can even use them for measuring length because this block is 10 centimeters long you could use this for measuring lengths of things this is one centimeter you can measure area using this block or, or a whole range of different blocks you can measure volume so you can fit these into a container. Again that's way beyond early years but I'm just pointing out a few advantages that are relevant. The disadvantage of these and I mentioned it already compared to the bundling sticks is that you can't unbundle them. So we can't snap these and take the little pieces apart. We have to just look at this as 10 and we can see it's 10. It's not difficult. You can see the little cubes indicated by the sawn marks along the block you can easily count there are 10 after a while you just don't need to you know there are 10 you know this is 100 you can count all the little squares on the top so you can see what it is but you never get the opportunity of unbundling and rebundling that you do or ungrouping and regrouping unlike the 10 frame with the counters or the bundling sticks or the unifix cubes these are fixed so what that means is when you do operations work with students and you have to do a regrouping or what some people call borrowing which I don't particularly like but anyway whatever you call it so like if you're adding 24 plus 37 and you have to add the 4 and the 7 and you've got all these ones you would have in that example 11 ones you would want 10 of them to be grouped together and moved into the 10 place the only way you can do that with these is to swap them so you have a handful of these little ones and you put those on the table and you pick one of these up and move that across and there's a trade that happens and it's an equivalent trade and students can understand it's worth, worth the same amount but they don't get to actually pull it apart. So there's a conceptual gap there or a leap that they have to make perhaps is a better way of putting it that the students need to understand that the swap we're doing does not change the value. See the bundling sticks are better because if you had 11 sticks you could grab a rubber band wrap them around 10 of them and you haven't even changed the sticks they're the same sticks so that's really important 
at that point. Again, I'm going a little bit beyond what we're talking about in this course, but I think it's worth mentioning it. Oh, just in terms of names, you may have heard these called Dean's Blocks. I think the mathematician who came up, or the educator who, who invented these, was a chap by the name of Dean's. In Australia, they're called uh, MAB blocks. I haven't heard them called that in anywhere else in the world, but that's multi base arithmetic blocks. So, whatever you call them, I think it makes sense to call them base 10 blocks. And there we go. Okay, that's the end of the notes. And so we've come to the end of the video and the end of the course. Thank you for being a part of the course. I do hope that you have really found this useful. Of course, the videos are available for you to watch again. Um, as you wish. I'm not expecting you to watch them over and over lots of times, but you may like to have a brush up in the future and you should have access to these through your account um, that we're using to give you access to the course. Um, there is a follow-up online exam to do as a result of completing this course. If you wish to receive a certificate of participation, you may not, you may be happy with what you've seen already, but if you'd like to test how much you remember and how much you've understood, the questions in the test are all multiple choice, so um, it's all done online, it's all done automatically, you don't have to wait for me to mark it, um, and all the questions are based directly on content of the videos. So if you've watched the videos carefully, if you've read the notes, if you've followed the notes, especially if you've taken your own notes, which of course you probably are because you know how to study, um, you should have no trouble passing the exam. As always, if you'd like to give feedback, I'd love to hear what you think. I'd love to hear what you would like next. If you've enjoyed this course and you'd like further courses that you can do online, let me know. I've got a number in the, the pipeline, as it were, a number that are in the planning stage. So we want to cover number facts. We want to do a big one on place value. There's a whole lot of, we're looking at math foundation. So that's the focus of our business. That's my focus as an educator. There's so much work to be done. Um, I really want to equip and uh, serve teachers in that regard. So once again, thank you for being a part of the course. I've really enjoyed presenting it to you. I look forward to contacting you about future opportunities, and I look forward to hearing from you as well. And so that's it from me, and I'll see you some other time in the future.